Hello and welcome to Comic Culture. I'm Terrence Dollard, a professor in the Department of Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. My guest today is John Morrow. He is uh, from uh, Two Morrows Publishing. John, welcome to Comic Culture. Well, thank you, Terrence. It's an honor to be here. Uh, now, you are an unusual guest for our show. Normally, we speak to um, writers and artists, but every now and then we do get to speak to someone whose interest in comics isn't on the creative side, it's more on the scholarly side. And I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, what you do at Two Morrows. Well, okay. Um... What we do at Tomorrow's is we publish a wide array of books and magazines about the history of comics and uh, biographies of various cartoonists and comic book artists. So uh, it sort of stemmed out of, you know, my childhood love of comics. Always been a comics fan since, since the early days of my life. And um, never, never imagined or dreamed I would ever be at all, you know, focused in the comic book field in my career, or especially that I'd get to meet and work with a lot of the professionals that I have. But uh, it just kind of evolved over time. Um, and it all kind of stems back to Jack Kirby, who was always my favorite comic book artist. And you were telling me before we started that um, you began publishing around the time that Jack Kirby passed away. Um, so how have you honored Jack Kirby? Because uh, I know that you do have a, a, is a Jack Kirby collector. Correct. Um, that was our first publication, Jack Kirby Collector Number 1. It was a, a very modest 16-page hand photocopied uh, fanzine, basically, that I produced in uh, September 1994. Jack passed away in February 94. And at that point, I'd been out of comics for probably six to eight years or so. Um, the, uh, the last stuff I really remember reading was Watchmen and the Dark Knight. And I really, really enjoyed those, but kind of felt at that point like the comics had sort of gone as far as I could, I could take them, or at least as far as they would interest me. So I kind of got out of comics. We were working on our, our business, which was a small advertising agency here in North Carolina. And um, we, we got our business off the ground and started having a little more free time. At that point, Jack died in 90, uh, February 94. A friend of mine sent me a newspaper clipping of his obituary from USA Today. I hadn't read a comic in, like I said, five or six years, but that really really sparked me to get my old Jack Kirby comics out of storage, read through them all, and, and that spring I decided, wow, somebody should really be doing a newsletter or, or fanzine about Jack Kirby. Surely he still has fans out there, even though he hadn't really been actively uh, drawing in comics for about a decade. Uh, so we just kind of on a lark. Uh, my wife said, sure, it'd be a fun thing to do in your spare time. We'll keep you out of trouble. Um, so uh, we, we had our graphic design equipment from our advertising firm and uh, just tried to produce a, you know, a semi-professional, nice little hand photocopy thing. I, I photocopied, uh, I fed coins into the uh, Xerox machine at our local drugstore and copied 125 copies of the first issue and uh, just sent them out free to people who had written in nice tributes about Jack to Comics Buyer's Guide right after he had passed away. Sent it out, I figured if it lasts four or five or six issues, it'll be fun. Just kind of see what the results would be. Um, but the response was uh, beyond my wildest imaginings. Uh, we got at first a trickle of letters, and then uh, we started getting dozens a week. Uh, and to the point where I'm like, well, I get her copy another 125 copies. Um, about the ninth printing, I think, of the first issue at 125 copies at a time, I was getting really tired of hand feeding those those copies, so you know we we took them and had someone print them for and Xerox them for us. Um, around issue six, it had grown to the point where we decided to try it uh, in comic book stores and see if there was any interest. At that point, um, it, it really exploded. The the circulation tripled on it. Uh, comic stores started catching on to it. We started having color covers and, and actual offset printing instead of photocopying. Um, and from there, it just kind of kind of snowballed. Kirby had so many fans that were still still interested in him and, and honestly were really embracing this publication we were doing because it was all about the fans. And fans would send in art from their collections that Jack had done for them or they had purchased somewhere. Uh, people would write articles for it. And um, before I knew it, we went from doing uh, six times a year. At one point, we were doing uh, six double size issues a year. But right now, we're up to issue number, I'm working on issue 73, actually, as we speak. Um, that one is 100 pages, and we're printing them out about four times a year, but it's all full color, you know, very slickly printed, and uh, it's really, it's just amazing how it's expanded over the years. And you took that success, and you, you branched out into other areas of comic fandom, and I guess in a way you've you sort of become uh, almost a historian. You, you are making contact with, with writers and artists throughout the, uh, the years of comics and kind of telling their stories uh, or maybe what they were doing during a certain uh, run of a comic or something like that. So how do you make that jump uh, from the, the Jack Kirby collector to being sort of this overall historian of, of comics? Well, it's just been kind of a sort of a natural progression, a spinoff from Kirby. Uh, I teamed up with a fellow named John B. Cook, 
to do our second publication, which was called Comic Book Artist. It was sort of like a Jack Kirby collector, but for all the other artists out there. That one really took off when Eisner Awards um, sold just really, really well and um, really cemented our place kind of in uh, the comics industry as sort of the, the de facto publisher of comics history publications. Um, at that point, you know, it's just sort of a, a, a bit of osmosis. You, you kind of start absorbing all of this information from all the things you publish. And over time, uh, you know, I used to kind of uh, be a little hesitant to, to embrace that term historian. I'm just a fan, right? I, I enjoy Jack Kirby. I enjoy these other artists. Um, but I'm just doing it for the love of it. It did eventually get to the point where, yeah, I, I can accept that I'm a historian now, as are the other editors that work on our publications here. Um, we, we were in addition to comic book artists. We started uh, Alter Ego, which was a fanzine in the 60s. Um, Roy Thomas came back to basically resurrect that in the 90s. That's still going strong. We've got over 150 issues of that out now. Uh, we did Draw Magazine, which is a how-to magazine um, by Mike Manley, uh, done on a very professional level, showing people how, how the actual art and stories are produced. Um, but uh, we're, it, 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 there's, so many, there's just so many possibilities and avenues for us to explore comics history and the lives of these artists. They, you know, these guys, we grew up all enjoying their work, guys and, and women. Um, it, here we are now, we've been doing this, I've been doing this almost 25 years now. We're still not running out of material to cover. There's still so many great stories to tell and so many great creators to cover. So you mentioned Alter Ego, uh, which was one of those early fanzines. How does Roy Thomas approach you and say that he would like you to sort of pick up that mantle and, and move it forward? Well, um, and I had to have my memory refreshed on how that actually came about. Roy didn't come to us. Um, John, well, let's see. Actually, I guess I, John B. Cook says I went to Roy. I thought John did. So we're, we're, our memories differ. But one of us went to Roy and said, hey, you want to restart uh, Alter Ego in the back of Comic Book Artist Magazine? Do a little section there. And Roy was was very excited to do that. That You know, he's... He's just a stone cold fanboy at heart. He always has been, despite all of his great success in the comics industry. And um, it, it was a great chance for him to kind of get back to his roots because he did alter ego for, uh, I think, eight of the 10 issues in the 1960s he was directly involved in. Um, it only ran 10 issues then and then faded away when Roy became a professional. So, um, you know, after five issues in the back of Comic Artist, the response was really very favorable. And I decided, hey, Roy, do you want to do this as an ongoing magazine on its own? Roy was all for it. So um, here we are 150 issues later and uh, still going strong. Roy has still got that same love of comics that he had back in the 60s before he started working professionally. And uh, Alter Ego, I think that was, if I'm uh, not mistaken, that was sort of like a, an examination of comics, uh, not necessarily comics themselves. It would be sort of maybe an essay on some storyline or something along those lines. The original 60s version? Yes. Am I mistaken? It was. Well, it was the original, like, superhero-focused comics fanzine. Um, and each issue had historical retrospectives of things. He had a few interviews in there. Um, and each issue progressively got a little more professional, a little slicker, to the point where, you know, you look at the final issues that came out, um, they were really very professionally produced. Uh, you, it wasn't just mimeographed fanzines as it started. It was actually being offset printed. Um, Roy even got Marvel to let him run ads in the Marvel comics in like it was 1969 for the last issue. So um, it was pretty, had pretty widespread circulation as well. But the problem was Roy was a professional at that point, Stanley's right hand man, just didn't have time to do it anymore. So it kind of languished for, for about three decades till we went back to Roy and say, said, hey, let's start this up again. So how do you make that jump? I know you mentioned that, that people were interested in the Kirby Collector uh, magazine. Um, but how do you then approach uh, a distributor who's going to take your book uh, and get it into the comic shops throughout the country, perhaps even internationally? Well, basically flying by the seat of our pants. We had no idea what we were doing with publishing. Um, our background was in advertising and graphic design. So we could produce a nice looking publication. But with the business aspects of it, learning how comic shops worked and how distribution worked, that was, that was, there was quite a learning curve on that for us. Um, but, you know, it's a testament to Kirby's uh, the, the love people have for Kirby in the industry, uh, not just with the fans, but with the retailers, that they took a chance on our, our modest little fanzine there around issue six and um, actually carried it in the stores and saw that, you know, not only were they doing a good thing by doing that, but it was selling for them. And um, that it's still going on today here almost 25 years later. I think, I think the retailers made a good move. But if they hadn't taken a chance on us, I imagine we would have made it about six or eight issues and that would have been it and, and nothing else would have come of tomorrow's. 
And um, so once you have that successful book, once you start adding alter ego to it, you, you start adding some other publication. There's back issue, and you had mentioned draw before. So how do you come about uh, back issue, which seems like, um, as the name implies, you're looking at you know, maybe a run of uh, Spider-Man done by Ramita and Lee or something like that, and, and kind of breaking down what was going on in the bullpen at that time. So how do you make that uh, decision to go into another um, uh, publication at that point? Well, we knew Alter Ego had, had a pretty good lock on covering the history of comics from the late 1930s up to late 60s, early 70s. But uh, because of my age, I'm 50, almost 55, and um, I grew up reading books of the 70s and 80s predominantly, and then had to work backwards to get to the 60s books. And I knew no one was really covering those books in depth. So I remember it was on my 40th birthday. I, I talked to uh, Michael Urey, who's um, had a, a long career in comics as a writer and editor, and uh, called him up. We'd worked together uh, previously on a history book on the history of the Captain Action action figure. And um, loved, just really enjoyed working with him. Felt it was time to do that publication and called Michael up and said, hey, why don't we do this? Michael had some time in his schedule and felt like, okay, let's do it. So um, there was a publication in the 80s called Amazing Heroes, which I read pretty regularly. And I won't say that was exactly our template for it, but that was kind of the audience we were trying to reach. Uh, I think we, we branched out with Bakish and treated things a lot differently. Um, but uh, it, it's that has actually taken off just incredibly well. Uh, and it's a testament also to Michael and his professionalism and Roy Thomas with Alter Ego. Neither of those guys has ever missed a deadline. Michael just hit issue 100. Roy just hit issue 150. Both of those gentlemen never missed a deadline. They work very far ahead. They're just consummate professionals. Uh, just total joy to work with. And they're never running out of material to cover because they, they love comics so much they can always delve back into the old books and find new things worth talking about. Now, it's, it's interesting, too, because you mentioned Roy Thomas going from uh, being a fan to working at Marvel in the, the late 60s. And um, I, I believe somewhere in my house I have a copy of the uh, George Perez uh, art book. I forget who published it. But in there was an essay by Mark Wade. And I'm wondering if you were ever tempted to parlay your... Uh, your connections in comics into writing or uh, trying to get your own characters published? Um, no, actually, I think I'm one of the few who probably never tried to capitalize on that uh, when in that position. I guess I probably could have. Uh, my, you know, my dream as a kid was I wanted to be a comic book artist, not a writer. I wanted to be an artist. I just never had the chops for it. Um, so I never, never imagined I would ever actually make some kind of a professional living in the comic book industry. I particularly never imagined I'd end up being a publisher. But um, you know, I, I still have, I have some artistic talent uh, because of our graphic design field, but um, not necessarily geared toward comics by any means. So, no, it's, I, I'm perfectly content to, to you know, uh, rub elbows with some of these wonderful artists. So you talk about George Perez, what a wonderful guy. Just a fantastic guy. To a fault, artists and writers in comics industry are such generous people. They're fans at heart, most of them. I mean, they don't, you don't go into comics thinking you're going to get rich. You go into comics because you love it. If you make some money at it, great. If you can make a living at it, support yourself your whole life, even better. But, uh, but genuinely, they really love it. They love what we publish, and they're all generally always happy to contribute. Uh, schedules permitting, of course. They're very, very busy, particularly nowadays. The schedules uh, really keep guys from maybe doing as much with our publications as we'd like them to do sometimes. We have to be patient, but it all works out. It's funny because you you mentioned how nice the people are. Um, every time I go to a con and I meet someone, they always are willing to spend some time with you unless they've got a, a super long autograph line. You know, they'll tell you a story about what they were doing when that issue came out, whether it's related to the story or whether it was, you know, they burned dinner that night. But they're always willing to talk to you and chat with you. And um, actually, you were at Heroes Con. I don't know if you personally were there, but but uh, tomorrow's had um, uh, a booth set up at Heroes Con uh, this year. So I'm wondering... Uh, are you doing a lot of the cons, or is it just local in North Carolina? Well, Tomorrow's has a booth at um, our main conventions are Heroes Con, uh, New York Comic Con, uh, WonderCon out in Anaheim, which is in the spring, and uh, Comic Con International San Diego, which is in the summer. Those are our four main conventions. We do um, so occasionally do appearances at small events, and um, we also do a lot of Lego events. We publish a magazine called Brick Journal, which is all for Lego enthusiasts, so we do a lot of traveling for those events as well. But those are our four main comic shows. Heroes Con, we're, we're blessed to have this great show right here in our backyard in Charlotte. Uh, just a yeah, two or three hour drive away for us and always a wonderful show. I mean, it's still geared, it's geared like 99% toward comic books. And the Artist Alley is huge. So what you're talking about, going up to their to their tables and, and 
struck up a conversation with your favorite artist, it's so easy to do there. And it's so one, wonderful and fun to sit there and watch them actually sketch at their, at their uh, booths, at their tables, um, doing commissions for people while they're telling you these stories. Uh, we love Heroes Con, and you know, if we didn't live in North Carolina, I think we would still make the trip from wherever we were to go. That's just such a wonderful show. It's my favorite show of all uh, as well, and I think because it is that focus on comics. Um, and one of the things that I do when I'm at a convention is I, I do try and you know, make a, a personal connection with some writers and artists and see if they'd be interested in being guests on our show. And I'm wondering if, if you're able to sort of use that as a network where maybe you're going to meet the new artist who's hot on the scene and make a connection that eventually will lead to some future issue. In the early days, we did more of that. Um, the conventions have gotten so much more hectic over the last 20 years. I remember you know, 15 years ago being at uh, the San Diego Comic-Con and it was maybe a third or a fourth the size it is now. You had more time to go out to dinner with people, strike up conversations, just go grab a bite to lunch. Um, now it's so business oriented to try to sell something or make their next sales pitch or pick up a job here. Um, it, it's a lot harder to do nowadays, I must admit. Uh, that's one thing we like so much about Heroes Con. It's a little slower pace, uh, a little more mellow laid back, and you do have more time to keep those connections going. Um, the other thing, so much of what we do is geared toward older artists, um, and that's that's a great thing. We're, we're glad to do that, but it doesn't it doesn't lend us so much to making a lot of connections with the newer, younger, hot the, you know the hot artist of the month kind of thing. Uh, we do still focus on them um, from time to time, particularly in Draw Magazine. We will, but our, our core magazines, Back Issue, Kirby Collector, and Alter Ego, and Combo Creator. The, a lot of them are on the more classic artists, and I'm not talking necessarily guys from the 40s, although Alter Ego does still feature people from the 40s and 50s, but you know, the 70s and 80s that, and 90s now, that's our bread and butter. Um, those guys are still on the convention circuit, and uh, you know, it's nice to see them and spend some time with them when we can. That's a lot easier, honestly, to just you know, pick up the phone or send them emails and connect that way, um, because they're at a show, obviously, trying to make a living as well. And uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're in high demand and kept very busy with those long autograph lines. Yeah, the one thing I found is that um, it's very difficult to get a, a guest uh, for this show sometimes because they, they're facing a deadline or you're catching them in between a show or something like that, which is why it's uh, impressive that Mike Manley is able to, uh, in addition to his work uh, for some syndicated newspaper strips, able to work on Draw for uh, tomorrow. So um, how do you create that publication? How do you get Mike involved and, and uh, how do you sustain that uh, sort of ongoing lesson in, in art and the process uh, for a... I don't know how many issues now. Um, well, let's see, draws third issue 34 will be going to the printer in the next two weeks or so. Um, the, the, the quantity of issues Mike's able to put out is much smaller than, for instance, back issue, which started actually after draw, I believe, but has 100 issues out now, whereas draw has 34. Uh, that's a, that's a, a good indicator of how much time and effort it takes to put an issue of draw together. When, you're, uh, when you've got a writer who can interview someone over the phone, and then put an article together for one of the other magazines, that's a lot speedier process than pinning down an artist who's got you know, hectic, hectic deadlines to meet for their normal paying job and say, hey, do us a how-to tutorial about how you do oil paintings or watercolors or how you work in Photoshop. Um, these guys, again, these guys are always eager to do it, but the trick is always trying to fit it into their schedule. I know that's a struggle for Mike to keep the magazine out on a regular schedule. And we've actually gone to sort of an irregular release schedule the last couple of years. Um, we, we're not taking subscriptions on Draw anymore. It's just when an issue's ready, we'll solicit it and, and take single issue orders on it. Uh, the magazine's not going anywhere. It's just a question of time. Mike's busy with his own professional work, but also his cohorts that he's trying to, to interview and get to do pieces for the publication are just as busy as he is. So um, it's a challenge, but at the same time, I think readers are just so glad when they see a new issue. They're, they're pretty forgiving of the sort of irregular release schedule. And you mentioned that you're, uh, you've got a new magazine out for Lego collectors. Um, and I'm just wondering, of all the things that, that fans are into, uh, why do you make the, the leap towards the, the building block uh, rather than, let's say, anime or uh, manga or something along those lines, more traditional comics related? Well, it, it all stems from an old friend of mine, Joe Mino, who's the editor of Brick Journal magazine. Um, Joe has been a Lego enthusiast his whole life, the way I've been a comic book enthusiast my whole life. Joe approached me one day, and he had been doing Brick Journal as a, just a digital-only free publication online for a couple of years at the point he approached me. I wasn't even aware of that. We'd sort of lost touch over the years, and, uh, but he knew I was doing the publishing. Um, called me up and uh, said, can you give me some tips? I, I think I want to bring this into, into print form. 
And I said, sure. So I took him out to lunch and we sat there and I kind of talked about the whole Lego community because at that point I honestly had no idea there were all these adult Lego builders out that were just as into what they're doing as adult comic book collectors are into their hobby. Um, over lunch that day, we talked about the various ins and outs and pros and cons and pitfalls of publishing. Um, I think I'm probably scared him pretty badly, <laughs> giving him the, uh, the lowdown and all we had to learn to do it. Um, but I remember ending that conversation saying, if you decide you, if this is too much for you to deal, give me a call. We can talk about it. I, there's got to be some crossover between Lego fans and comic book fans, I would think. Um, about two or three weeks later, Joe called me up and said, okay, let's, let's do it. You publish it. Uh, I said, well, hold on, let's do a little research. And um, after researching, I found that, yes, there is quite a bit of crossover between Lego fans and comic book fans. Um, you can tell that just by the things that the Lego builders build. They build lots of comic book related uh, uh, creations and structures. So um, it, was a, it was kind of a slow burn on, on uh, Brick Journal, but we had a lot of support from the Lego Corporation in Denmark as well. Uh, they initially got it into the Lego stores for us, which was immediately a great thing. Uh, helped build circulation on it very early, got a, a very strong subscription base on it. And now we're up to actually issue 50 of Brick Journal is going to be coming out early next year. Uh, we're going to do that as a special double size book to sort of celebrate the 50th issue. And um, it's got a very strong support in the Lego fan community. And, um, you know, we were, we're able to sell some comic stuff at our Lego conventions and vice versa. Some of our Lego publications at our comic conventions. It's a great, a great match for us. It really is interesting because when, when you go to the conventions, uh, most of them have, uh, you know, the vendors' tables and whatnot, and you do see a lot of Lego stuff, and it does seem like Lego is kind of catering to it, whether it's uh, the Lego Batman movie or whether it's, uh, you know, the Star Wars sets that they put out that uh, we fans are, you know, thinking would look really cool on the set of their TV show. Um, <laughs> so uh, it seems like you have a pretty good idea of how to keep your publications fresh and how to keep the, the, the buyers uh, buying. So when you look at the other magazines that have come and gone, um, you mentioned, was it Amazing Heroes in the 80s? Mm -hmm. uh, and then there was uh, Wizard, um, and then there was uh, Toy Fair, uh, another magazine that had come out, kind of capitalizing on the comics boom of the 90s. You've managed to, to last, um, and I'm wondering if you've had some sort of business model that works for you, and, and how you think you've been able to uh, keep your head above water. Um, well, our business model does work for us. I'm not sure who else it would work for. Um, we, we, um, we work a lot of long, hard hours, not just myself, but all, all the various editors, our designers, our writers. Um, and we do rely on the generosity of the friendly comics fans out there as well. They provide articles, art, uh, and contacts for us throughout the industry. Um, really, I, I think it all kind of honestly goes back to Jack Kirby. Jack was such a beloved figure in comics, and he still is. So I think by starting with a Jack Kirby publication, um, that was the springboard for everything else. That got us such goodwill within the industry. And like I said, I had no, no visions whatsoever of doing anything beyond four to six issues of a nice little Jack Kirby fanzine. This wasn't some master plan that I'm gonna start with that and, and build to where we are today. Uh, a lot of it just kind of naturally happened um, through, through the kindness of a lot of people and the hard work of so many of our, of our people that work on our publications. So, um, I, I can't I can't believe I don't think we could do it again if we were trying to start where we started in 1994 we we're trying to do that today I don't think we would succeed and I've seen too many of our competitors come and go I've seen too many new startups with what were nice ideas for publications but they failed after three or four issues a lot of that's due because we got the internet to compete with now um, a news publication there's not much point in a print news publication now because you get your news instantly off of uh, comic book resources or Facebook. So um, we cater to our core audience, which loves things, first of all, printed on paper, even though we do digital editions of everything. Um, the far and away, our, our printed paper products outsell digital. Uh, and I'm that same way. I like reading about the old stuff. I like learning about the history of the industry. And I like it, something tangible I can hold in my hand and read at, at my leisure. So um, yeah, if we were starting today, I don't know how we would, I, I don't know what business model we would come up with. Um, I think it would be really hard to do what we do now, starting from scratch. But we built such a nice, uh, a nice track record here, and um, we have so much to build on. Uh, we're about to start a new publication as well. Uh, we haven't officially announced it yet, but hey, here you go. It's it's called Retro Fan. Um, it's for um, in the same way comic book artist was uh, the Jack Kirby collector for everybody else. 
Um, Retrofan is going to sort of be the back issue magazine, but for everything not comics. Uh, there'll be a little hint of comics in there, but it's more about the, all of the fun stuff we all grew up uh, with as kids, whether that's, you know, Ben Cooper Halloween costumes, the history behind those. Um, uh, our, our first issue has an interview with Lou Ferrigno about working on the Hulk TV show. We'll have features on Slurpee Cups, action figures, um, Hot Wheels. Um, uh, I'm blanking on everything we've got for our first few issues, but uh, Michael Yuri, who edits Back Issue Magazine, is going to be editing Retrofan as well. And uh, he and I are currently working, working really hard on having this ready to launch next summer. Um, we're hopeful that this will catch on the same way our other publications did. It's a little bit of a stretch for us, but I felt like it was time because we have delved more into straight pop culture type publications with some of our books recently and further away from comics. We did a book called Monster Mash, which is about the monster craze of the 50s and 60s. Um, sold just really, really well for us. It was a wonderful book by a gentleman named Mark Voger. Um, we're about to release a, release a new book called Groovy, also by Mark Voger. That'll be coming out in about a week. Uh, it's all about the whole flower power craze and how it affected pop culture throughout the 60s and 70s. Um, so we're, we're kind of making a conscious shift a little bit more toward covering pop culture in general. We're still going to do just as much with comics, but branch out a little bit more and see how that goes. Um, I just feel like we're the perfect people to do it. We've got this, this built-in core audience that really wants to learn more about the history. And um, so that's, that's kind of the direction we're heading right now. Well, I see that we have about a minute left. And I just wanted to um, ask if you could show, uh, tell our audience rather, how they can find out more about you, share your website or Facebook page or something like that. So that way they can find books if they don't have a local comic shop. Absolutely, and we do sell directly from our website for people that don't have a local comic shop. Our, our website is www.tomorrows.com, but that's spelled T-W-O-M-O-R-R-O-W-S.com. Um, we also have apps on the Apple App Store for each of our magazines and one for our books. Um, you can find us on Facebook. Just search for Tomorrow's Publishing. And um, we're on Twitter, Instagram. Um, out there, we're pretty easy to find, but uh, the main starting point is our website. All right, well, John, thank you so much for taking time out to talk to us today. Uh, I'd like to thank you at home for watching Comic Culture. We'll see you again soon.